2.0. So that's us super cutting edge because, you know, it's, it, it, well, as Joshua will tell you, it's just on the verge of being out. Thank you so uh, yeah. much. Hey everyone, how's it going? So thanks for having me. This is my first time back at a national lab since uh, my first job after college, which was at Lawrence Livermore. So it's good to be here. Um, I can say that uh, Berkeley is way prettier. The view from the hill is beautiful. Um, anyway, uh, I'd like to introduce TensorFlow. Not that Livermore is not pretty too, but this is really something. So I'd like to introduce uh, TensorFlow 2 today. And what I'll do is um, basically I'll point you to a bunch of resources uh, that you can try uh, today during the hands-on workshop and you can try uh, later on on your own time. And I'll start with just a quick overview and walk you through what TensorFlow 2 is, and then I'll show you some intro examples and some advanced examples. And the goal is not gonna be to cover all the concepts in the advanced examples, just to give you tutorials you can check out uh, later. So the short story is that TensorFlow 2 is, the main goal is ease of use. And currently it's in beta. And I guess I'll just start live. Let me show you where to go to find all the TensorFlow 2 tutorials. So you can do this in the workshop, but if you go to tensorflow.org, and what you should do is uh, ignore pretty much everything on the website, um, except what you find at tensorflow.org slash beta. And um, go to learn, and then TensorFlow. And our website's a little bit slow recently, I'm not sure why. And then click on TF2 beta. And I know that's sort of hidden up here. And what you'll find, easier through the URL, what you'll find on this tab, these are all the latest tutorials and guides and everything we're writing for version two goes here. There's me getting a horrible sunburn. Um, and so during the workshop later, we're gonna walk through some of the, we've very roughly divided these things into beginner and advanced. And during the workshop, you'll work through a couple of the basic tutorials and as time remains, some of the advanced ones. Um, if you haven't learned TensorFlow 1, well, first of all, you do not need TensorFlow 1 knowledge at all to use TensorFlow 2. And if you have not previously used TensorFlow 1, you should not. Um, just, start, <laughs> just start directly with TensorFlow 2. Um, Google's learned a lot, and the community has learned a lot about uh, developing deep learning frameworks in the last few years. Uh, the field uh, itself is advancing really fast, but so is the software engineering side. And as we've uh, learned a lot about the needs of Googlers and the community, we've adjusted the library to match them. So TensorFlow 2 is just as fast and performant, but it's much, much easier to use. Um, briefly, let me just, I don't think you've done any code yet. So let me just show you a little bit of code really quick, and then we'll talk in more depth about it. So uh, we have some really mini examples. If you were to click on Get Started for Beginners, uh, TensorFlow 2 gives you different styles of code that you can use to define your neural networks. And at the beginner's end, we have something called the Keras Sequential API. And uh, if you're new to this, which I think a lot of people are, I wanna walk you through exactly what it is. So first of all, every single tutorial and guide that you find on this page is runnable end to end. And we're really proud of this. It means that uh, the code all works. So for all these tutorials, they're actually Jupyter Notebooks on GitHub. And the way we build our website is we have a script that just reads the notebook, converts it to HTML, sticks it on the web page. So for any of these, you can go to GitHub if you want, you can download it, you can run it locally, or for any of these, you can run it in collaboratory. And let me just give you a quick overview of Colab. I know you're gonna be using lab hardware today, uh, but Colab is awesome if you're at home. So what Colab is, it's a free Jupyter Notebook environment. Um, it's provided by Google Research. Uh, it's basically Jupyter Notebooks in the cloud. And what's important about Colab, uh, for our examples, is that it comes with a free GPU. So when you open up a collaboratory notebook, whoops, this is really high res, you can hit this connect button in the top right, and that will give you a virtual machine on Google Cloud. Um, you have root access to the VM, so you can install whatever you want, you can upload data. The VMs, uh, they get deleted every like 12 or 24 hours, so don't stick any data on there that you wanna keep. Um, You'll notice I'm connected now, and that means I can use this exactly like a Jupyter Notebook. At the start of a lot of our tutorials, and this is the only thing you'll need to uh, keep in mind, Colab by default, it has all sorts of software installed on it. It's got Scikit-Learn, it's got TensorFlow 1, it's got PyTorch, it's got Keras, it's got all sorts of great libraries. You need to install TensorFlow 2 at, in Colab uh, at the start of all our uh, 2.0 beta tutorials so you can run the thing. Uh, commands that start with a bang inside Colab, you're running a shell command. So if you do bang ls, you'll see the directory that you're in in your VM. If you do bang pip, you can install software. 
And this is the only thing that takes a moment, uh, but you'll have to kick this off when you start all of our tutorials. Here's how you enable a GPU. The first thing to be aware of is if you want to use GPU uh, enabled TensorFlow 2, you have to change the install command to read like that. All the tutorials that need a GPU will do that for you. Then what you need to do is enable a GPU inside the notebook. So if you go to edit and then notebook settings, you can pick a hardware accelerator. Uh, don't choose a TPU. Um, TPUs will require a small amount of code changes and we're working on making that uh, no code changes. But for right now, uh, GPUs on a single machine will just work out of the box and your code's identical. There's nothing else you need to do. So you can enable a GPU and when you hit connect and then you hover over the, uh, this guy up here, you'll see it's connecting. I know it's like two point text, but you'll see it's connecting to a GPU backend, which is great. All right. Um, before I explain what this tutorial does, I want to show you the code for a neural network. And what we're looking at here is this is a If we had just written and defined our model like this, we would have multi-class logistic regression. And the simplest way to define a neural network in TensorFlow 2 is using what we call the sequential API, which says, I'm going to define my neural network as a stack of layers, one after the other. And 90 plus percent of machine learning problems in practice will fall into exactly this. Uh, what you can see, if instead we wanted to do a neural network, uh, instead of a logistic regression model or a linear model, what we could do is this. We could add another layer and we'll choose the width of the layer and we'll give it a ReLU activation. And now we have a neural network. And if we wanted to have a deep neural network, not Z, this is a new laptop, so I'm not familiar with the keyboard. Now we have a deep neural network. And now we have a deeper neural network. So, one thing that's a blessing and a curse about uh, deep learning, as you're finding out, is there's a ton of concepts. So uh, no one should attend a school like this being new to this stuff and seeing terms like dense layers and ReLU and being like, oh yeah, like I totally now have intuition for what's happening in all these layers. It takes a long time to learn the concepts. But what I hope you've just seen is that writing the code is much easier today than it used to be, which is a really good thing. Um, Sequential models, and I'll explain what Keras is in a second, because this is slightly weird. Uh, sequential models, when people develop with this style of code, it feels imperative. It feels exactly like doing regular Python programming. But what you're actually doing is behind the scenes, you're defining a data structure. And your data structure here is very simple, it's a stack. And what this means, and this should be interesting maybe, even if you've been developing with Keras for a while and didn't realize this, when you say model.compile, here we're using a very high level API to set up our model. And you can choose you know, the way you want gradient descent to work. Maybe you've seen SGD, you know, maybe you've seen Atom or things like that. Thanks. But anyway, you can choose optimizers out of a box. You can choose your loss function and categorical cross entropy is something that you would use when you're doing classification. It's basically loss function that compares to probability distributions, metrics that you wanna get printed out. But what's interesting is when you say model.compile, uh, at compile time, uh, obviously, we can do checks, basically making sure the shapes of your layers are compatible. And what this means is that we can catch programming bugs before you start training and running your models, which is a really good thing. This is what we want. Uh, in the next style of code that I'll show you in a minute, uh, it's a little bit more flexible than this, but we can't check things at compile time. You can train your model with a single line of code. And uh, whenever you train a deep learning model, uh, the very first thing you should look at is overfitting and underfitting. So one of the reasons that deep neural networks are so successful for things like classification is they're super powerful. And if you decide to define like a really deep network, and by deep I mean the number of layers, and you make the layers wide enough, and by that I mean the number of neurons per layer or units per layer, and you train the thing for a long time, it's probably going to memorize your training data. And this is a good thing. Because of that, it's also very likely to badly overfit and do a horrible job on your validation and testing data. There's lots of different knobs you can tune to prevent networks from overfitting. Uh, there's things you can do like adding regularization, like L2 or dropout. Uh, you can reduce the size of your layers. You can mess around with your optimizer. But the most important thing is just this single number here, epochs. And an epoch means you've used every example from your training set once to update uh, the weights on your model. So an epoch means a single sweep through your training set. 
it's a single round of gradient descent with every example. The longer you train these things for, uh, the more tightly you're gonna fit the training data. And so you can basically figure out that right number, the magical number for epochs by plotting the loss in your training data. So the way I would set this up, I would choose a silly large number of epochs. I will, and you know that from experience, but I'd train this thing for 20 epochs, long enough to memorize the training data. As you're training, you make a plot and you plot the loss on your training data and you also plot the loss on your validation data. And basically, when you start training, all your weights are initialized randomly. So the loss on both your training and validation data will be decreasing. As your model begins overfitting or memorizing the training data, the loss on your validation data is going to start increasing. It's gonna get worse and worse and worse. And when that begins to occur, that's the right number of epochs to train for. So you train these models until your validation loss starts increasing. Um, a lot of what people focus on, and one cool thing about giving the talk at a lab, is uh, when they start learning deep learning, you'll spend all your time messing around with stuff like this. Like what's the right model architecture and what types of layers should I use? But in practice, this is by far the smallest part of doing deep learning successfully. It's all about thinking about your problem. So what are you trying to model or what are you trying to classify? How do you evaluate it? How do you know you've done a good job? How do you know your models are gonna work well in production when they're deployed on data you've never seen before? And so it's really thinking about your experiment that's hard and setting up the right experiment. And once you have that done, this you can mess with and figure out. But anyway, it's what you'll start on today. Anyway, uh, let me just run this code really quickly. I probably should have installed TensorFlow 2 before I started uh, explaining it. But we'll let this go and you'll see the output. Uh, that takes a minute, so I'm gonna pull up I'm gonna pull up another example while that's running. If we go back to the getting started page and we click on get started for experts. Oh, before I show you this, I promised I'd explain what Keras is. So, um, anyway, it's running model.fit right now. There's also methods like model.predict. And you can see for every epoch, uh, it's reporting the loss on the training data. And there's parameters you can set to have it automatically report the loss in the validation data too. Anyway, here's the first thing that's weird. So who has used a library called Keras before? Okay, so half of you. Here's what's interesting. If you go to keras.io, keras.io is wonderful. This is an independent open source project, nothing to do with TensorFlow. Uh, if you do pip install Keras, you get what you find at keras.io. Behind the scenes, Keras will automatically install another deep learning library. And that can be TensorFlow, it can be CNTK, it can be MXNet or whatever. What Keras is and why Keras is so successful, Keras, and you've just seen this in our getting started for beginners example, Keras is an API spec. So Keras says basically there's different ways to define your deep neural networks. One such way is the sequential API, where you define a model and you add layers to it and you compile it. What Keras doesn't say anything about is, here's how you multiply matrices quickly. So when you actually need to train these things, Keras uses another library behind the scenes to do the math and another library to handle, how do I get this stuff onto the GPU or whatever. If you do pip, ins anyway, this was extremely successful. This was the first deep learning library that was really, really, really user focused and really, really clear and easy to use. It was, uh, and we love it on the TensorFlow side. So now it's also built into TensorFlow. If you do pip install TensorFlow, every example that you find at keras.io will work if you change the imports. So you take any example, instead of from keras.models, you say from tensorflow.keras, and the rest is the same. TensorFlow 2 is a superset of Keras, and it has stuff that you won't find at this web page. If you're new to deep learning, this is a wonderful place to start. Anything you learn at keras.io will feed directly into TensorFlow 2, so you're not wasting your time. In fact, there's a whole book that I'd really strongly recommend called Deep Learning with Python by Francois Cholet, which is by far the best book to start uh, your deep learning journey uh, from a practical developer side. It's 40 bucks, it's, there's no math, it's not an academic textbook, but it's basically, here's how you do the thing. So if your goal is to learn how to like, I want, show me the simplest way to train an image classifier or a text classifier, and by simplest, I mean simplest, but not black box. It's not like model equals my magical text classifier dot train. It's, you know, you're at least defining the models piece by piece so you understand what's happening inside. 
Anyway, it's wonderful. Deep learning with Python. Uh, TensorFlow adds a lot on top of this. And right now we're talking only about Python. So let me show you some Python that's different in TensorFlow 2 that you won't find at keras.io. <clears throat> if we go back to our get it, starting, get it Started page and we look at TensorFlow 2 for experts, this is a very similar model to what we saw in the beginner's example. It's another MNIST thing, which maybe I'll walk you through in a sec. But the model is defined in a very, very different way. So if you've been doing deep learning for a while, this might look like Chainer or PyTorch. And what we're doing here is we're defining our model by subclassing a class defined by the library. And here in TensorFlow, we call it model. Different frameworks will call it different, oh god. Different frameworks will call it different things. And this should feel a lot like object-oriented NumPy development. In the constructor, and by the way, of course, you can add parameters as you like. You can override all these methods. Here we're defining our layers. And uh, in the call method, which in some libraries is called predict or forward, this is what happens when your model or your layer gets called. And what's wonderful is TensorFlow 2 is what we call imperative or eager by default. If you don't know what eager means, uh, lucky you, it's just the way Python works. It means imperative. So out of the box, TensorFlow 2 works exactly as you'd expect Python code to work. And what this means is that if you're really curious about, I want to see exactly what the output of some convolutional layer is, um, you can do print x or print x.shape. And these are tensors, but they also have nice, any tensor in TensorFlow 2, if you want to get into NumPy land, all the tensors have a .numpy method. So if you have a tensor, you can just call t.numpy, now you're back in NumPy, which is great. So this is wonderful for learning the, uh, the basics, or not the basics at all, excuse me, for learning exactly the details of what's going in and out of these layers, what are the shapes, uh, what does my data look like. So it's great for debugging. One thing that's new in TensorFlow 2 that I also want to show you is there's two ways, and by the way, this is also a Keras model. Keras has three ways of defining models. It has sequential, which you should always start with and you should always use first. Um, because sequential models are the easiest to debug. And they're also the easiest to share with friends. So if I'm looking at a code from a student and she writes it using the sequential model and there's a bug, I can immediately see it. It takes like 30 seconds tops. If she writes it using this subclassing model, it can take me 15 minutes to find it. That's because this is new and there's few standards for how you write your code this way. Um, with the sequential model, your code is a data structure. With the subclassing model, your model is Python bytecode, which means you can do whatever you want, but it's also tricky to debug. So that's, that's the trade-off. Um, they're both wonderful. You can't go wrong with either. There's also the functional API in Keras, which some people really love. So sequential is a stack. Functional API you would use if your model is a DAG or a graph. So it gives you a little bit more expressivity than the sequential model. Both of these models can be trained in two different ways. Regardless of whether you use the functional, sequential, or subclassing, you can train your model with model.fit, which you should always start with, unless you want to poke around with the details. And here's how you poke around with the details. So in TensorFlow 2, um, you can also train your models with what we call a gradient tape. And uh, basically, what a deep learning library is, in a nutshell, a deep learning library is a matrix multiplier because uh, almost all these layers under the hood, uh, you forward and backward by multiplying matrices. So deep learning library, and this is true of TensorFlow, CNTK, MXNet, all of them, multiplies matrices. It can also do that on a GPU. Great. All of the deep learning libraries, they have uh, different ways of defining layers. And they have automatic differentiation. And that's what we're seeing here under the hood. So TensorFlow uses reverse mode auto diff. And this is basically writing model.fit from scratch. So the tape will trace uh, all the operations that are inside nested on this width block. And it literally plays them back on a tape to compute the gradients. And so here, this is our forward pass. We're making some predictions on images. We're calculating our loss, which is a single number. And what's great is if we say tape.gradient, we're saying TensorFlow, please give me the gradients of the loss with respect to all the variables in my model. If you print those out, you'll get the uh, gradients. They're a Python list. This means if you happen to be um, you know, much smarter than me and, you know, you're doing research on optimization and you're implementing like the new Berkeley optimization method, 
uh, you can implement it in just regular Python. And it's very, very easy to poke around with. Uh, one cool thing that TensorFlow 2 does, the only piece of non-standard Python. So if you did TensorFlow 1, you learned about you know, sessions and graphs and placeholders and all this stuff is very cool. Um, but TensorFlow 2 has none of that. There's only a single line of not regular Python that you need to use in TensorFlow 2, and it's this. And it's totally optional. It's TF function. If you do TF function, what this will do, so one piece of slowdown in deep learning libraries is behind the scenes, TensorFlow is a C++ engine. We're writing code in Python. When these operations are actually executed, we're going from Python to C++, compute the results, send it back to Python. So we're ping-ponging back and forth line by line, which is slow. If you do at TF function, what you're saying is hand this entire function to the C++ backend. And I'm not a compilers engineer, but if you are, then you probably know all different optimizations you can do to the code if you analyze it statically. So compile the code, optimize it, compute it, send back the result once. And this can give you anywhere from a zero to 10x uh, speed up uh, on your code. And it's a single line. It's awesome. Uh, anything that you can stick inside TF function, you can stick inside a TensorFlow save model if you're exporting things. If you do TF function, it makes your, hard, your code slightly harder to debug. The error messages might make less sense. So the way this works, when you're developing your models, don't use TF function. Develop your model, debug it, all that stuff. When you've finished developing, if you care about speed, which I don't often, but if you do care about speed, add a single TF function. And the way to find the best practices for this is look at our advanced tutorials. And usually what we do, you don't need to add this on top of, this is recursively applied. So you don't need to sprinkle your whole code with it. Usually we just stick it on top of our training loop. And that's it. Um, so we like this a lot. It's super user friendly. Um, so what's really relevant for the lab is distributed training. So in the guides on tensorflow.to, tensorflow.org slash beta, you'll find a guide for distribution strategy. And I want to show you what distribution strategies are. So here's some Keras model that we've defined to do whatever. And if we want to run this, the most common case of distributed training is one machine with multiple GPUs. And uh, this is called data parallelism. So there's a parameter uh, called batch size, which is how many examples do you use to do a round of gradient descent. Larger batch sizes means more accurate updates. So the simplest way to do distributed training, if you have one box with a lot of GPUs, is you increase your batch size. So let's say the most that one GPU can handle is 32. You have two GPUs. You give 32 examples to each GPU. They do the forward pass, backward pass. You average the gradients. Um, What's nice about distribution strategies is that's the complete code for data parallelism. And uh, there's more that are being developed. Uh, there's different strategies for different network configurations and different number of machines and different numbers of accelerators. Um, it's really cool stuff. And what I'd like about these is they're super user friendly. Um, when you, even on a single machine, by the way, a big gotcha is your data input pipeline. So let's say you're doing something like training an image classifier and you're reading examples off disk. Uh, a um, huge slowdown is, this is called GPU starvation. So uh, one issue might be your GPUs are faster than the code you've written uh, to read images off disk. And um, if you have a small data set, the easiest way around this is just use NumPy, load the whole thing into memory. You don't have to worry about it, have a nice day. If you have more energy to invest, you can use something called TF data. And TF data, it's a data pre-processing pipeline that's written in C++, but you can call it through Python. Uh, it's a little bit faster, and uh, it has all sorts of utilities that you can use to get data onto GPUs. All right, so I want to show you a couple examples. And um, uh, before we do that, let me point you to a few uh, really cool examples we're working on that you can try during the workshop. So. Uh, Steve's going to walk you through some basic stuff and some advanced stuff, and here's some new stuff. Uh, so we haven't published these yet. Uh, they should be on the website later this week. Uh, I just uh, sort of pirated the code and uploaded it, but that's okay. It's about to be open sourced anyway. Uh, what this is is a tutorial for image segmentation. So this will train a uh, image segmentation model on the Oxford Pets data set. Uh, the reason that I wanted to give you a link, and you can just jot this down so you have it later, it's bit.ly slash tf dash seg. It's just a Jupyter notebook. And what's nice about this is it runs in about five minutes or less. 
So a lot of our advanced tutorials, like CycleGAN, that I'll show you in a sec, can take a little bit longer to train. But this is fast enough that you can do it uh, almost interactively. And so it's a really nice uh, advanced example that's fun that you can play with quickly. So tf-seg, and I can give you the links later too. And there's another one I'll show you. Uh, I'll walk you through this. I just made these slides a second ago, so it's a little funny. This is a, a code example for Deep Dream. And this is based off of a GitHub repo that I have, but this is cleaned up so it runs a lot faster using TensorFlow 2 best practices. Mine's kind of crappy. So this is bit.ly slash tf-dream-2. Oh, uh, yeah, so the reason this requires sign-in is I didn't have time to upload this to my GitHub account. So what this is, is this is just a notebook sitting on my Google Drive. Um, if you can't access it, I'll fix that in a sec. I just wanted to get this to you. If other people are having trouble accessing it, um, I'll fix that right after the talk. I probably just messed up the sharing settings. So tfseg and tf-dream-2. And uh, let's do this. Let me talk briefly about TensorFlow beyond Python. And then uh, I want to talk a little bit about deep learning very, very quickly. I know you've uh, covered a little bit of convolution. I just want to say a few more words about it. Then we'll do linear regression just to show you the mechanics of writing TensorFlow 2 code from scratch. And then we'll do deep dream. And the reason we're doing deep dream and linear regression is the code is very, very, very similar despite doing two very different things, which is a nice feature of TensorFlow 2. So there's also something called TensorFlow.js. And every time I pick up my laptop to do this, I unplug the little bit. Every time I pick up my laptop to do this, I unplug things and it's horrible. But what we're looking at, carefully, carefully, it is not meant for this many people, but <laughs> this is a model called PoseNet. And uh, even though I'm filming you right now, uh, this is relatively private. Uh, so no data is being sent to the cloud. This is all running locally uh, in Chrome. It'll work in Firefox too, or your favorite browser. So this is running locally. It's entirely in JavaScript. It's GPU accelerated, so it's fast. And what's interesting is I just bought this a couple days ago because my personal laptop uh, died. So this is my home laptop. And it's the cheapest uh, MacBook you can buy right now. So it's still not cheap, right? It's like 1100, 1200 bucks. <laughs> but um, the point I'd like to make is, even on this hardware, this is running at, I can't see it, it's probably like 20 frames a second. This is fast, right? And it's doing something that's pretty sophisticated. So the reason I'm showing you JavaScript, and this may not be relevant to stuff you're working on at the lab, but it's a really cool way, did I destroy it? No, it still works. Great question. Is it related to the Xbox? Uh, no. So I'm not, I, my guess would be that it's not related to the Xbox. I suspect, but I could be totally wrong. The Xbox has some sort of radar type device to physically measure your distance. This is purely just vision. Um, I'm not sure which is, the question was, is it, how does it compare to the Xbox? And I'm not sure. I don't have an Xbox. I only play games on my laptop. <laughs> um, but the reason I'm showing you that is uh, I am not a JavaScript developer. And when I heard about this idea to do machine learning in the browser, my gut instinct was like, that's silly. Because I spend a lot of time being like, I love Python, but it's slow. Why on earth are we going to JavaScript, which is probably even slower? As soon as I saw stuff like this, I was like, well, I was totally wrong. The reason we care about doing machine learning in JavaScript, and this is a huge game changer, of course, like we want JavaScript developers and people using other languages to be able to develop with deep learning without having to switch to Python, obviously. But the reason we care about JavaScript is because it runs client side. So this gives you another deployment option. So as a Python developer, the way I deploy models is I start up a REST API. And the crappy way to do that is you use Flask or whatever you want. If you're at a large place like the lab or a company, you can use something called TensorFlow Serving. And TensorFlow Serving is part of the TensorFlow ecosystem. It's exactly the same code that Google uses to serve models internally. Um, you can download it to C++ library. It will load in models you've saved in Python and throw up a REST API. So that's high performance, but it takes some time to set up. But deploying in JavaScript means you can just push models out to your users and they run client side. And this is really, really cool. So it's a new paradigm. And it's only about a year old. Uh, and we're seeing tons of cool applications all over the place. TensorFlow, um, because I'm talking about the ecosystem, it also has, it's a very, very big project. A huge thing right now is Swift for TensorFlow. And this is something uh, Chris Latner and others are working on. So Swift is a modern language, it's compiled, it's fast, and uh, there's a lot of engineering hours being poured into this project. 
basically implementing TensorFlow in Swift. Um, there's a whole class you can take on it from a company called fast.ai. Uh, it looks really promising. So if you happen to be a Swift developer, that is a completely legit place. There's no need to use Python. R, uh, JJ Allaire uh, from R Studio, also did a phenomenally good job implementing TensorFlow in R. So if you're a statistician and that's your background, uh, you can use very similar APIs. Uh, they're all Keras to what I'm showing you directly in R, and it's great. So it's a big project. Um, there's lots of other things that you'll find on our website. Um, one really useful one is TensorFlow Hub. And TensorFlow Hub is a library of pre-trained uh, models. I want to give you some caveats. They're working on upgrading TensorFlow Hub for TensorFlow 2 right now. Um, some examples work with TensorFlow 2 and some don't. So just FYI. Um, let me talk a little bit about deep learning. And then we'll do some more code. So deep learning is representation learning. And I want to add a few more words on convolution. And usually when I teach deep learning, I start with convolution instead of dense layers. Because um, if you have a single dense layer and we had more time, it's very easy to interpret what a single dense layer is doing. When you have a DNN defined as a stack of dense layers, who knows exactly what features the subsequent layers are looking at. But you can see it very easily with convolution. So convolution is not a machine learning concept. Uh, and it's something you've probably used. So this is just a code example in SciPy to do convolution on an image to detect edges. Uh, convolution is how all the uh, filters in Photoshop work for uh, sharpening things and blurring things and uh, finding edges and stuff like that. And something interesting is in SciPy, I chose the, uh, they have a bunch of built-in pictures, but I chose the uh, astronaut picture because I like astronauts. So my first question is, does anyone know who the astronaut that's built into SciPy is? because this is a sciencey place. <laughs> She's famous enough to get built into sci-fi. Yeah, I know, you could use your phone. Anyway, it's, it's Aline Collins, and she was the first woman to command the Space Shuttle Columbia, which is a big deal. Anyway, I just want to show you what convolution means. So you'll see this a lot in deep learning. We take terms that, are, that mean a lot of things. So if you're an electrical engineer, you know way more about convolution than I ever will. In deep learning, convolution, we mean slide. And here's how we slide to detect edges. And I'll show you this fast and then slow. So convolution starts with something called a kernel or a filter. Uh, you'll see in deep learning, there's multiple names for the same thing all the time just to make it fun to learn. So here's a filter that can detect edges. And there's a couple important things about this. So the first thing is you'll notice this filter has nine numbers. Eight of them are negative one, and one is eight. The reason that this can detect edges is the intuition is if we take the dot product of this filter and an area under the image, the dot product is going to be zero if all the pixels have the same intensity. And it's going to be a larger number if the pixels are different or there's an edge. Um, the way this works is that's the result, but let me show you how to compute it. If you do the SciPy convolve code, and I'll show you exactly how that works in a second, that's the output. What's really, really interesting and wonderful about convolution is it's super efficient. So if you think about it, if you wanted to detect edges on an image using a dense layer, you're gonna have a bad time, <laughs> to quote South Park. So you're gonna need a very wide layer, and that dense layer needs to learn to detect edges separately at every chunk of the image. So you're going to have different neurons that learn to say, is there an edge in the top left corner? You'll have more neurons, is there an edge next to that? And this is stupid. With just nine numbers, though, we can find edges all across the image. So this is many, many, many times more efficient. This actually isn't much more than linear regression. So y equals mx plus b, just to find the best fit line, that's two parameters for the slope and the intercept. And here, with just seven more, we can get edges everywhere on the image. So convolution has a lot of nice properties. And here's what I mean by the dot product just so you can see, and this is how the library works too. We take an image and we take our filter and we have an output image. And we drop the filter in some chunk of the input image. We take the dot product, that's just one times two plus zero times zero plus one times one and so on and so forth. And we sum that up and that's, that's the output pixel. And then we convolve or we slide and we take the dot product again, we get another output pixel. And we convolve and we convolve and now we have an output image. And there's more to it too, you can learn about padding and stuff like that. And, strides and pooling and whatever, but that's, that's basically convolution. And here's how this fits into deep learning. Here's what the deep in deep learning means. So I stole these from a friend of mine, Martin Gorner. He's a much better artist than I am. But here's an image 
And an image isn't 2D, it's 3D. So an image often has three color channels, red, green, and blue. And if you printed the shape out of this thing in NumPy, you might see 10 by 10 by 3 with height, depth. So red, green, blue. And what's interesting is, <clears throat> too much Diet Coke, we can convolve in 3D in exactly the same way we convolve in 2D. So we're still doing a dot product. But now our filters are three-dimensional. So filters will always pass through, the entire, pass through the entire depth of the image. And so if we start convolving this filter, we're still taking a dot product. And as we slide, we get output pixels. And I'm just going to fly through it. If we slide for a long time, we get an output image. In Photoshop, you write the filters by hand. Here, the filters are learned. But let's say I had written this by hand for some reason. So this might be edges. What's great about Great question. If your image doesn't have symmetry or the filters don't evenly divide the image, then you can use concepts like padding and stride to deal with that. But for right now, I'm just going to pretend just to fly through it. Excellent question. To fly through it, I'm going to pretend that it just evenly divides it and we don't have to worry about that. Um, the way to find out how to deal with images that are different sizes, if you look at the TensorFlow API docs for convolution, and maybe I'll show you that in a sec, you'll see a whole slew of options. But here's the important point in deep learning. With more filters, you get more output images. So these might be edges in a different orientation. And you can have as many as you like. So if you see a layer, let me show you what such a layer might look like in code. We pull up, this is our beginner tutorials, convolutional neural networks. And this tutorial is a bit of a lie. Um, uh, what this tutorial is, it's not really a CNN tutorial. This tutorial is trying to say, I am the minimum amount of code you need to quickly train a convolutional neural network. But it doesn't teach you about CNN. So if I have energy, maybe we'll update it later. But what we're looking at with this layer here, what this is saying is, give me 32 filters. So let's say the input image to this layer was 10 by 10 by 3. Here we'd be learning 32 filters. Each of the filters would be 3 by 3 by 3. Every filter goes through the entire input image, and we're learning 32 of them. Uh, that means the output of this layer is going to be a stack of 32 images. Each filter outputs an image. So that base would be 32 deep, um, all detecting different features. And what happens, and what's really nice, so the deep learning part happens at the next convolutional layer. So at the first layer, the filters are learning features of pixels, which are basically edges and colors. Right? At the next layer, if we have a bunch of filters, again, we can have a very, very deep image. But now these filters are learning features of features. And features of edges are basically shapes. At the next layer, you're learning features of features of features, which are textures and whatnot. And so deep learning is this, you learn this hierarchy of features, all of which you learn automatically. And it's this really powerful concept. And what's great about it is if you start your deep learning journey with convolution, you can visualize exactly what these filters are detecting. And you can actually do tricks with them using things like Deep Dream. Um, and then only at the end, by the way, it's, the filters are very easy to understand at the first couple layers. But if you have a CNN that's 20 layers deep, who knows what layer 19 is detecting. But you can use Deep Dream to poke around with it. And then at the very, very end, that's when you have a dense layer. So what a CNN is doing, your dense layer does the actual classification. So what your CNN is doing, it's basically a really, really cool feature processor, preprocessor, that you get for free. Um, and there's a couple different cool research directions, too. So let me see if I have a slide for this. I may or may not have the slide I'm looking for, so give me one sec. What you learn about when you start deep learning is image classification, <clears throat> which is really, really important. Given a picture of a cat or a dog, predict if it's a cat or a dog. Key skill. Much more interesting question, and you can spend a long time on that. Much more interesting question is given that the model says you've got a cat, you're asking, why did it say I have a cat? What features is the model looking at that it used to make the prediction? And you might not care about it for cats, but it's useful to do basic science in other domains. So um, I'm sure you've all heard about this. So Lily Peng, a few years ago, became really famous for doing work on uh, diabetic retinopathy detection. So you've probably seen these pictures. If you Google around for like Google research blog, diabetic retinopathy, you'll find um, she did an experiment where you know, a patient will take a, a picture of their retina, and she tried to classify the scan of their retina as diseased or healthy to assist ophthalmologists. But basically, 
Lily did really amazing work, not in writing a fancy image classifier, but in applying it to an important domain. So that was image classification applied somewhere where it mattered. Much more interesting, though, was the follow-up work, which is given that the classifier said that a picture of someone's eye was diseased is asking why. So like what pixels in the eye were indicative of the disease? And the reason that's important is you can hand that off to a physician or somebody doing basic science like you might have at the lab, <clears throat> and that could guide their future research. Or it could be a tool that may or may not be helpful. And Lily's group did other things, which was asking, given that you have this data set, can you predict somebody's blood pressure based on a picture of their eye? The answer turned out to be yes. And then also, which pixels in the eye were indicative of blood pressure? And you can actually see anyway. So uh, image classification and interpreting how these things work are sort of two sides of the same coin, and they're both important. So let me show you some. All right, let's do this. I'm going to point you to a couple examples, then I'll walk you through linear regression, then I'll walk you through deep dream. So in terms of examples, here are some of the latest tutorials we just published. <sighs> I'm good. I've got Diet Coke, but I've been having too much Diet Coke. Thanks. So <laughs> great question. So the question was, within the same layer, do the filters all need to be the same shape? Uh, usually, you want the output to be the same shape. So usually, you know this, all the outputs I have are these rectangular volumes. That just makes it easier for the next layer. You could absolutely have different shapes in your output, and you could absolutely have different shapes of filters. You could use 3 by 3 filters, 5 by 5 4 by 4 And your idea, which would have been researched a few years ago, was can you use different filter uh, shapes at the same layer? And your idea is good. The answer is yes, you can. Um, I don't have slides for it right now, but there's, there's a bunch of famous computer vision image classifiers that you can read about. Uh, one such model is VGG. And VGG, there's VGG 16, VGG 19. They're basically just deep stacks of convolutional layers. And then a few years later, you'll see fancier models, things like ResNet that have you know, skip connections and things between the layers. But one such paper that you just hinted at is called Inception. One question if you're doing computer vision research is what's the right filter size? And what Inception basically said was we don't know. So at each layer, Inception will run like a one by one filter, a three by three, a five by five, and it basically averages the results. So it's sort of let's try everything and it helped. Um, so yes, you can have different filter sizes. In our tutorials, almost always, we'll just have a single one. And uh, one challenge with deep learning is it's hyperparameter soup. So um, for almost any paper, uh, you'll find a million different parameters you can play with. How many layers? What's the size? Um, what are the different, thank you so much. What are the different activation functions? Um, you can experiment for a long time. Um, divine, uh, developing these models, I was going to say divining, is a bit more of an art than a science right now. Um, one such project, speaking of the TensorFlow ecosystem, I don't have slides for this, but if you Google Keras Tuner, Keras Tuner is a library to make it easy to basically do hyperparameter tuning, which means trying different combinations of things and seeing which works well. I only know two ways to do this manually. One way to tune hyperparameters, which you should not do, is grid search. So that's trial combinations of a couple different settings because it's very slow. Slightly faster than grid search could be random search. The reason you don't do grid search is often settings that are very close to each other have basically the same performance. So you're wasting time by doing grid search. So you can do random search. Even better, uh, if you're a mathematician, which I'm not, there's all different uh, search algorithms that you can apply to hyperparameter tuning. And there's library Keras Tuner that has some of these built in. And it looks, it looks really, really, really good. There was a talk about it at Google I.O. this year, which looks great. <clears throat> so Keras Tuner. All right, I was going to talk about GANs. So GANs are a really, really interesting idea. And basically, I just want to say one word about GAN and then point you to useful stuff. So TensorFlow 2, right now we have really, really, really good GAN tutorials. Uh, and the reason is they're fun uh, to look at because we've been spending a lot of time developing them. And we have this nice sequence of GANs. What a GAN is, um, almost all the problems that you look at while you're learning are classification problems. It's given a picture, classify it. Uh, or you might do regression, you know, predict a price or predict a probability or predict the weather, right? A um, much harder problem is image generation. And so if I say to you, don't classify the image, but synthesize me a picture of a cat, you know, that type of problem is like a very different order than classifying things. 
And the reason it's hard is in deep learning, everything we do needs a loss function. So all these uh, DNNs are trained by gradient descent. The way we get the gradients is by backprop. The problem is, if you want to synthesize a picture, we need a gradient uh, that tells us if our picture is, is good or not. And uh, the way that, uh, this is from 2014 from Ian Goodfellow, the way that we can generate images is by training two networks in parallel. We use one model, the discriminator, and the discriminator is just an image classifier. Its only job is, uh, given a picture, say, is this a real cat or is this a cat that somebody synthesized? We have a second network, which is a generator, and the generator starts life knowing nothing about cats. And we teach the generator to generate increasingly realistic cat photos over time by training it against the discriminator. So this is called adversarial training. Um, and it gives us a loss function that we can optimize against. And some of the, <clears throat> by the way, all these papers, all these tutorials, though, they should uh, also link to the papers that they talk about. So you can read more detail. Our first Gantt tutorial, it's important because it runs fast, but it's boring. It works with MNIST, which you'll see you know, forever. Um, but uh, what we're doing here is, this is just a little gift the tutorial produces that shows you the digits it's learning to generate over time. And it starts with random noise and they get increasingly better. And uh, by the way, just a detail here, we seed the generator with random noise. Um, that's so it doesn't learn to produce exactly the same image again and again and again. And the reason we've fixed the random noise for each of these plots, which forces it to generate the same image so you can actually see the progression. Anyway, uh, DC GAN, great, proved the point. Actually, this was a later paper. But very, very quickly, uh, you can do much more sophisticated things with GANs. So this is a model I bet a lot of you have heard, of, uh, heard about recently. Um, it's called Picks to Picks. And this is from a wonderful group out of Berkeley. And here, uh, although we have a whole bunch of data sets, the input image here are these beautiful facades of, well, not beautiful, the output is beautiful. Here are these probably grad student produced cartoon drawings of facades. And uh, here's the building they correspond to. And this is the output of the fix to fix model. And the reason I'm showing you this is this little web page will run end to end in Colab. So if you click the run button, it will download exactly the data set that you see here. We'll train the model and show you the output, which is this. So it's beautiful. Um, I mentioned experimental design being important. Uh, another thing that's obviously important, I'll just say this is not being an asshole. And I bet a lot of you have heard about picks to picks recently. Uh, just some people did a crappy company based on picks to picks, which I think is now sunset. So um, there's a lot of good work you can do with deep learning. You can think about how can we, you know, look at how these models are analyzing patients' eyes. But if you're also like a teenager, you can do really silly, pointless things. Um, and so uh, that's that's just something we're dealing with as a community right now. Um, anyway, another beautiful, beautiful paper from the same group at Berkeley is CycleGAN, and this is real. This is what the tutorial makes. <clears throat> CycleGAN is a different fish than pix to pix So in pix to pix you need paired input-output data. So you need a facade of a building, and you need a photograph of the building. Um, there's things where it's very hard to collect paired training data. So one such example is day and night. So if you want a picture of downtown San Francisco during the day, it's hard to get exactly the same picture at night because cars move around and stuff like that. But there's also data sets where it's almost impossible to get paired training data because the paired training data doesn't exist in nature. So here, CycleGAN is translating from horses to zebras. And it's called Cycle because it can also translate from zebras to horses. And there's no such way to collect this data set because it doesn't exist. Um, so what the authors of this paper realize is that although you can't get a one-to-one -one mapping, what you can do is get a directory of horses and a directory of zebras. And the adversarial learning problem here is the generator produces an image of a zebra and the discriminator can't figure out if it's real or false. Like, could this image of a zebra belong in my zebra directory? The loss function also forces the image of the zebra to as closely match the input image of the horse. So if you stack these up, you'll see they're almost identical. And so we have these two loss functions. And if you look at the code, you'll see the code is almost identical to picks to picks It's basically, and in fact, that's how we wrote the tutorial. We import the entire picks to picks model, and we slightly change the loss function. So a lot of these cool tricks in deep learning are just thinking about these new loss functions that describe the problems you care about, and then training models. Yeah. Yes, good eyes. So one thing, the question was there's background noise and stuff like that. So there's a couple reasons for background noise. CycleGAN is one of our few tutorials that 
almost all of these will run in a few minutes. CycleGAN does not. Um, and this starts to push the limits of Colab. So Colab is meant for interactive research or interactive whatever development. We just run our tutorials in Colab because that's what we expect users to do uh, before they install TensorFlow in their local machine. And we didn't train this that long. If you train it for longer, the images get a little bit sharper. But if you look at checkerboard images in convolution, you have really good eyesight. And uh, yeah, there's a wonderful journal called distill.pub, which is nuts. Uh, it's called distill, D-I-S-T-I-L-L dot pub. And this is some of the best work around into understanding exactly what are these networks doing under the hood to classify images or do whatever you want. Um, so it's research in interpretability, and it's the best that I'm aware of. All of their articles have these beautiful interactive demos. But if you want to learn about checkerboard artifacts and convolution, they have a whole little thing explaining exactly why that happens. And it's an artifact of just the way filters work. So distill.pub is nuts. They publish very rarely, but they maintain a super high quality bar. And it's got, it was, I think it was started at Google by Chris Olaf, but uh, it, he left recently and there's contributors from all over the place. So that's CycleGAN. Another thing that might be of interest, and we just published this tutorial, uh, I think about a week ago. Um, so I'm not an expert in this area. Um, but uh, if you'd like to learn about adversarial examples, you've probably heard about these. And an adversarial example, what this means is it's an image. So this is a panda. To me, this looks like a panda. But by adding this uh, noise to the panda, we can trick the classifier into thinking that it's something totally different. Um, and adversarial examples are interesting uh, because they reveal weaknesses in the way these models work. Um, so uh, often, like, you know, we'll train these image classifiers and we'll be like, yes, like pat self on the back. I have this like super 99% accurate model, but really under the hood, it's, it's not doing what we think it is. And this ties in really nicely to work on interpretability. So uh, it would be good if we understood these models better so we'd have more confidence in the way they work. So, uh, yeah, great question. So for this and for GANs, what level of TensorFlow are we using to write them? And the answer is often it's a mix. So let's check. So here, with adversarial examples, we're using the gradient tape to train the model. The reason that we're using the gradient tape is we need the gradients. So the simplest way to create an adversarial example, which is implemented here, is we get the gradients of the image uh, with respect to, basically, we get the gradients, and I could be wrong. Um, we get the gradients just as we're going to do a normal step of gradient descent. And then what we do is we take a giant step really quickly in the wrong direction. So. Um, maybe under the hood all these images lie on some manifold and we're just jumping way off and that totally fools the classifier because we need the gradients we're writing the gradient tape this way however we're using basically regular keros to actually get the image classifier so in addition to tensorflow hub there's something wonderful called keros.applications and this is what i would personally recommend um, keros in both tf keros has a whole box of famous image models built in so here we're downloading one such model called MobileNet. And MobileNet has gotten very popular recently because there's a lot of interest in running models on phones. And uh, basically, or in web browsers, so MobileNet's really helpful too. One research direction recently, which isn't rocket science, but it's super, super valuable, is basically how can we train accurate models with fewer parameters? So uh, fewer layers, shorter layers, more efficient functions so they can run on different devices. And there's always this speed accuracy trade-off. Anyway, MobileNet has a whole bunch of different versions that run fast in different devices. But here, what we're doing is we're importing MobileNet. And at this point, you can say MobileNet.predict some image that you have in memory, and it will uh, label that image based on ImageNet. So out of the box, uh, when we're saying weights equals ImageNet, there's a big database out of Feifei Lee's group at Stanford called ImageNet. And ImageNet is famous for having like a little bit over a million images in a thousand different classes cats, dogs, flowers. And it's used in a lot of academic image recognition competitions. But it's famous, and you can download these models that have been pre-trained on ImageNet. And this makes it very easy to reuse these things. Uh, anyway, so this is a mix. And then if you look through the GANs, uh, like DC GAN, you might see that one model is defined using the sequential API. And you might find another is defined using something else. 
And so uh, the nice thing about TensorFlow 2 is you have different options based on what you're doing. Let me mix and match. Uh, another really good collection, we're gonna separate these out when we launch the library. If you wanna learn a lot about how this works under the hood, so if you're saying like Keras is great, but I have my own idea for the Berkeley layers library or anything else like that, and you wanna write your own, let me point you at resources that you can use to figure out how to do that. So uh, there's in the tutorials webpage, there's this guide section, which we'll break off later. If you wanna learn exactly how uh, Keras layers and models work, this is really, really excellent. And it will also introduce the sequential functional and subclassing APIs, which is great. We also have this awkwardly named needs to be expanded collection, which walks you through exactly what tensors are and how do they interop with NumPy, how exactly does TF function work and autograph work and stuff like that. And some of these guides are excellent. Um, so there's lots of details for you to chug through. Let's see, what else can I tell you? Here's the distribution strategy guide that I mentioned. And yeah, you can see this is under active development. So you can see there's different strategies supported right now for different types of uh, different styles of TensorFlow. By the way, uh, in addition to, in TensorFlow 2, uh, Keras is what we call the recommended API. So if you're starting TensorFlow 2 now, you should use the Keras libraries. TensorFlow is a huge project and there's another wonderful API called Estimators. And these were originally inspired by scikit-learn, but they grew to become a little bit more complicated. They're very, very popular internally, and they're totally supported in TensorFlow 2. They're wonderful, they're fast, but if you're starting today, you should probably start with Keras just because it's a little bit easier to use. But if you have existing code that happens to use these things, it's still supported, no worries. Is, so your, your common question was in TensorFlow 1.6, it was difficult to write layers. Yes, I agree with you. Has this problem solved in TensorFlow 2? Yes, it has. Um, so uh, I'm very, very happy with TensorFlow 2. <laughs> I think the team, I don't want to make like an Apple joke, like courage, but it took courage to like pivot the library. But this wasn't BS. What was the courage from Apple? To ditch the adapters, right? To ditch the ports. It was courage to, I forget exactly what they did. Um, but yeah, so this guide uh, will show you how to write custom layers. And what's really nice about it, as all the guides, you can run it. It will run end to end and the code should work. So it's great. While I'm flipping through stuff, does anyone have any questions? <laughs> Great question. What happened to TensorFlow Slim? By the way, I'll answer that in a sec. Let me explain why we have all these different uh, options. So TensorFlow 2 is a big project. And one of my favorite things about Google is it's very much bottom up. So like if I had an idea, which I don't, but if I had an idea for like the Josh library, if I had like instead of Keras, I want to do the Josh lib, probably I could take a swing at it. And if it was good, maybe I could open source it and get users. So we have a lot of people trying a lot of different ideas. This is how Keras came to be. So no one told the Keras team, no, don't do this. So they, they did it and it worked really well. We've had a lot of ideas that haven't worked so well. Slim, by the way, works extremely well, um, but it has a relatively small user base that has done really, really good work. Particularly Slim has a ton of really awesome pre-trained. They've done an excellent job. So TF Slim, they have a GitHub repo and it will be like, 10, 20 plus famous image classifiers with complete code and all that, it's great. But it's not what we're standardizing on. It's not that Slim is bad, we just pick Keras because it's got a large user base and it's a little bit more mature and easier to use. Uh, I don't know if it's deprecated or not. Another thing that's interesting about TensorFlow 2, when you're writing your data input pipeline, you've basically got two choices. You can use NumPy, which is what you should start with. And then if you feel like it, you can graduate to TF data. TF data can be faster, but it's also harder to use. And it's this trade-off where basically, if you have an engineering team, TF data is what you want. If you're a single developer just hacking around, probably start with NumPy or use TF data if you feel like it. It just, performance tuning takes some hours to get right. So if you're writing your input pipeline with TF data, you probably should benchmark it and start playing around with it. Um, anyway. I'm gonna show you linear regression from scratch, and then I'm gonna show you Deep Dream, and the code's almost the same, which is just why I wanna show you this, uh, surprisingly. Yes? Um, 
can I talk about TF agents? Unfortunately, no, I'm not a reinforcement learning expert. I've never used TF agents. Uh, my manager uh, does know a lot about it. Um, you can find him on uh, Twitter, Magnus Histon, uh, or check out the TF agents GitHub repo. Um, I almost certainly there's somebody in the room that knows a lot about reinforcement learning who can talk with you about it. Uh, you can try and find them during the workshop. Um, that's another interesting thing about TensorFlow, by the way. On the TensorFlow GitHub site, you will find like a whole zoo of different uh, projects like TF agents that are being implemented in TensorFlow. Uh, that's the actual TensorFlow code base. You'll find a ton of them. And this is a really, really nice thing, both from Google and outside of Google. Uh, what might be interesting, now having randomly pulled this up, let me talk about the first two. The first is Magenta. And Magenta is it's this beautiful project using TensorFlow for art and music. So have you ever seen a sketch RNN? This will take one second to load. So sketch RNN is awesome. It looks like a toy for kids, but it's not. So uh, one thing you'll learn about if you learn about RNNs, if you learn about classifying text and you learn about generating text, which is great. And we have a tutorial that will teach you how to generate Shakespeare. You can also apply this same idea of generating text to images. And sketch RNN, it's tiny, but here it's loaded for pineapples. And so if I start drawing a pineapple, sketch RNN is going to try and autocomplete my pineapple. Um, and, <laughs> and so what's interesting is, let me load a model for something more interesting. The octopus is a great one. I've never tried octopus. This is also running client side, by the way. I don't know how to draw an octopus. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, this is extremely cool. And it's also very surprising, right? So obviously, like, this is not going to put an artist out of work in the next long time. Um, but you could imagine doing like, a more serious implementation of this, where you had a tool that, you know, I, I get writer's block a lot. Maybe you could help artists with artist block, or if my job was to generate clip art, maybe I could see a bunch of possibilities and then steer the process. And what's cool is probably if I start drawing an octopus, <laughs> that was amazing. If I start drawing an octopus in a different way, uh, it, might, it might be able to autocomplete that too. <laughs> Does anyone happen to know, by the way, where the training data for this came from? Kids? It looks like kids, but sadly, it's adults. <laughs> yes, no glasses, can't see you. See you now. Yes, exactly. There was an app that Google made that had people draw stuff, and it's called QuickDraw, right? So QuickDraw, you'll notice there's somewhere on here, there's like a privacy thing. When you play QuickDraw, there's nothing identifiable, but it saves your drawings. And what's interesting, QuickDraw, by the way, used to be really easy, and it would be like draw, I don't know, like a truck. Now it's really, really hard because they have a lot of data and they're enriching their training set. So I'm, I can't do this. It's draw a camera. But if you start drawing a camera, uh, quick draw will give you like Where seconds. Square or suitcase. Oh, I know. It's camera. All right, I'm going to stop it right there. Anyway, uh, that drawing goes into the Sketch RNN database. Uh, and what's interesting about the drawings is drawings, I think of drawings as pictures. They're not. They're sequences. And because we have a sequence of brush strokes, you can train an RNN to continue the sequence. And so that's, that's how uh, uh, Sketch RNN came to be. And on the Magenta website, which is magenta.tensorflow.org, they have implementations of all this stuff. I should also mention, like, these are, it's awesome they share their code. A lot of our tutorials on the website are meant to be relatively minimal examples. So it's not like, let's train the world's most accurate image classifier. It's just show me some code that will get me started. These examples are intended to be like awesome. So these are just the code directly from the papers. So they take a lot more time to go through. But if you're serious about learning how any of this stuff works, it's all, it's all right there, which is super, super cool. Uh, the other project that I wanted to mention when I just randomly went to the uh, GitHub repo is called Mesh TensorFlow. And this is probably really interesting. The Berkeley Lab, uh, this is for like super distributed training. Um, there's a talk uh, from the TensorFlow Dev Summit you can watch that will go into Mesh TensorFlow in more depth. If you're a statistician, which I am not, this is another cool thing about deep learning, by the way. Um, 
uh, like I'm a average Python developer, which means I can help people out with their deep learning models. I'm okay with ML, but you'll see like right off the bat, there's all these really, really deep uh, sub-disciplines. So if your background is in stats, uh, there's this beautiful library which is implemented with Keras called TensorFlow Probability. And this lets you fit different distributions and do all sorts of cool statistical tricks which are out of my area, but might be interesting to you. Uh, another cool thing, if you feel like contributing to the TensorFlow ecosystem, uh, our whole docs repo is on GitHub. <clears throat> so if you see something with one of these tutorials that can be improved, you see something that doesn't make sense, please file a pull request or raise an issue and we'll do our best to fix it. Another really interesting project is federated learning. And so this might be of interest to you if you're doing research in privacy. And so federated learning asks the question were of, let's say that uh, all of us would like to train, let's say uh, all of us are users and um, we want to train a model that can tag our photos. So Google Photos does this now, but let's say Google Photos doesn't exist. So you want to upload a picture or you wanna have a picture on your phone and we want a model that says, that's a picture of you on vacation with your dog. Let's say that we wanna train this model together, but none of us wants to upload our images to a server, which we don't. How can all of us learn a model together while keeping our data private? And this is called federated learning. And it's a really cool research area. There's an implementation in TensorFlow and there's an article on our blog that you can read about. But it's TensorFlow federated. Something to be aware of for some of these projects, by the way, there's, there's a ton of them. And what I would do before you dive into them is I would check the activity log. And you want to find projects that are being actively developed and maintained and worked on. There might be some stuff in here that's a little bit older too. All right, uh, let me show you linear regression. And here's a link you can write down if you want to play with this later, because it's not on the website yet. It's, we have something similar buried into a tutorial, but this is self-contained. It's bit.ly slash tf dash ws1. Are there plans for TensorFlow to have a probabilistic language? Good question. I think that's TF probability, but I'm not, it's out of my area so far that I can't, yeah. Check out TF probability. They also have a very, very good talk. It's on YouTube from the TensorFlow Developer Summit. So let me just explain why we have this. Um, so what this notebook does is this is writing linear regression in the lowest level possible. You could do this with Keras too, but this is pretending we didn't have it. Uh, what this notebook does, I'll just go really quickly and just give you the highlights. It generates some random data, it generates a noisy distribution. As you might expect, it finds the best fit, best fit line. The other thing this notebook does, in case this is the first time you've, or you're new to gradient descent and you wanna poke around with exactly how gradient descent works, at the end of it, the notebook has code to produce this. Um, and what we're looking at here is when we do linear regression, we start with a random guess for M and B, the slope and intercept. And our random guess might be up here and it's plotting what those values were. And on the loss, on the z-axis, it's plotting the squared error. And then what we do is at each step of gradient descent, you can see how the loss decreases. <clears throat> and it's just a nice diagram. The reason I like this is um, it's real. Uh, and I've seen this diagram a lot in slides, including slides that I've made, but it's nice just to have a little code that makes it. Um, and then it also makes it easy to think about gradient descent, right? So like here, we know that linear regression has a global minimum. Deep neural networks do not. As a piece of trivia, uh, it's been a long time since I took calculus, um, but I remember, and I hadn't had any kind of neural networks, they weren't a thing then. But if, when I took calculus, I learned about local minimum, global minimum, right? And uh, if somebody had told me at the time, like, hey, like these DNNs, uh, it's unknown if they have a global minimum, and if they do, we don't know if we can ever find it. I would have said like, right, okay, that's training these things with gradient descent probably is not gonna work because that's what I learned in school. And uh, my intuition would have been totally wrong. And it turns out that a lot of people made the same mistake. It turns out that uh, to train a DNN to be accurate, you don't need to find the global minimum. You just need to find some point on the surface that works well enough. And it turns out that we can find points that work extremely well. And also uh, because these DNNs, they have so many parameters, apparently it's, it's much harder to get stuck in a local minimum, it's very bad. Uh, this also makes it easy when you learn about deep learning, there's a whole box of optimizers you can use. 
This one just uses gradient descent written by hand, uh, but you learn about things like RMS prop and Atom and stuff like that. And uh, a lot of the ideas, they have good intuition. So you might look at this and say like, well, you know, when we have our initial guesses for M and B, they're probably really bad because they're random guesses. So when we get the gradient, we might want to take a very large step. And then after we've taken a bunch of steps, probably our guesses are getting a little bit better. So we'll take slower and slower steps. And you might invent the idea of an adaptive learning rate or a decaying learning rate. Other things you might invent if you saw the surface, you might come up with things like momentum to help you roll out of like little local minimum and stuff like that. Anyway, it's just really nice. Uh, the thing that I wanted to show you, I just want to show you two things and we'll go into deep dream. Uh, for these DNNs, you always need three ingredients. You need a forward pass or a way to make predictions. And here are the way we make predictions. And in TensorFlow 2, this, these are tensors, but it looks exactly like regular Python. Our forward pass is y equals mx plus b. So given an x, predict y. Then our loss function is the squared error. And oh, yeah, so these are vectors. So we're getting our squared error. And then the thing that I wanted to show you is the training loop. And here we've written this from scratch, right? So uh, what we need is the gradients of the loss with respect to M and B. And the way we get that is given our training data, we make some predictions, we calculate our loss, and then outside of the width block, we use the gradient tape to get it directly. This is also a really nice example to have. So you can just print these things out and just see exactly what they are and what they represent, which is really nice. Um, another thing, by the way, about the style of code is if you're doing gradient clipping or something like that, you can implement it in regular Python. But what I want you to look at is the training loop. So it's that. And now I want to explain Deep Dream. And it's going to look very, very similar. Yeah, this is the new example that will be on the website, uh, hopefully this week. Um, so here's the idea in Deep Dream. First of all, who has seen Deep Dream before? And by that, I mean, who's seen pictures that look like, like this? So who's seen Deep Dream? OK, of the people that have seen it, does anyone know anything about it? Like, what is this? Why does this exist? Did someone sit down one day and be like, yo, I need to generate psychedelic images? Like, what was the goal in Deep Dream? Does anyone know? And so the result was an LSD trip. So this was like one of the original meme makers. So if you had, if you were like a Reddit user and like you had your hands on Deep Dream, now you have a lot of karma. So people just like banged out these psychedelic images and they're really cool. So when you look at this, what do you see? So first of all, what's, what's the picture that this started life as? Starry Night by Van Gogh, okay. And what has Starry Night become? Or like what, what is in Starry Night now that Van Gogh might not have put in his original painting? Eyes, animals. Because this is by far the highest resolution screen I've ever presented on, by the way. This is nice. I can see there's wheels. That looks to me like a truck, right? So where might these objects have come from? It, internet. So this, this is a generative model. So by a generative model, I mean Deep Dream is producing this image. We're not doing classification. All of the things that you see in Deep Dream appear in ImageNet from Feifei's group, her big database, ImageNet. And the reason that we see lots of eyes, dog faces, is there's a cute little nose. ImageNet happens to have lots of pictures of dogs, flowers, snakes, cars, stuff like that. Normally, in deep learning, what you do is you have a model, and the model has variables or parameters. And you adjust the parameters to fit the data. So you train the classifier by tweaking these weights. In Deep Dream, we start with a pre-trained image classifier. The goal is not to adjust the classifier at all. The goal in Deep Dream is, Deep Dream is an experiment to understand how image classifiers work. What are the convolutional layers that I showed you earlier actually doing? Like I had this kind of like hand wavy thing, like, yeah, like layer four is detecting textures. But Deep Dream is saying, is it really detecting textures? And can we see what the filters are detecting? So the idea of Deep Dream is we're going to start uh, with an input image, and we're going to modify the image to increasingly excite a filter in a pre-trained image classifier. So if we downloaded MobileNet or BGG or a model that you train yourself, in the forward pass, we take an image, we pass it through the classifier, it goes through layer one, layer two, layer three, blah, 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 softmax at the end and says it's a cat. 
In Deep Dream, we stop at the layer that we care about. So I might stop at layer four, and I'll ask the model to actually print out the activations, things that come out of the ReLUs at layer four. And that will give me a list of numbers. What I want is to find a way to modify the image to make that list larger, to increase the excite that layer. So here's how this works. <clears throat> There's a very small amount of code, which is why I find this so interesting. Here we're downloading ImageNet. This is the Keras application. It's pre-trained. We're getting the ImageNet weights. Right here, if we had a cat in memory and said base model dot predict cat in memory, you would probably say it's a cat. It's an image classifier. Great. If you do, and I think I can do this because I ran this code. Yeah, I disconnected from my VM a long time ago. Let's see if it can recover. Yeah, if you do model.summary, by the way, there's, yeah, if you do model.summary, you'll see a giant list of all the layers in the model. And the important thing here is that these layers have names. And uh, what we're doing is, the first thing we need is a forward pass. So when we push our image through the inception model, we get the output of some layers. And here, we've selected uh, these layers. And there's two ways to do deep dream. One is to maximize the activation of a layer or a set of layers, or you can maximize the activation of a specific filter. Here, we're just doing layers for fun, but you can modify this to work with filters. And the, what I mean by that is, um, This might be layer two, and as I've drawn it, layer two has eight filters. Here I'm trying to maximize the activations of all of them, as opposed to picking just one. Our loss, and there's some code here to simplify this, but our loss is just the sum of the activations. And normally we do gradient descent. Here we're doing gradient ascent. So we actually want to maximize this loss. So we want to modify the image to make this number higher, which means whatever features these filters are detecting, there's more of them in the image. And then in gradient ascent, what we do is we wrap our image in a TF variable. And this just means it's going to be able to backprop through this. And then what we do, you don't need this TF function, but it will run a lot faster if you use it. Here we get the loss. So this function will forward the image through the network. We'll sum up the activations in some layer. We need to go in the opposite direction, so we're taking the negative of it. And the magic of auto diff is once we have it set up this way, and before they cleaned it up, it looked all basically the same as linear regression, but now it's slightly tighter. The magic of auto diff, because we have everything in TensorFlow, we can get the gradients of the loss with respect to the pixels on the image. And if you print this out, uh, you'll see it has exactly the same shape as the image. And what we can do is we can uh, add that to the image. And in one round, the image will be modified to increasingly excite those filters. And so if we pick filters, this runs really quickly, by the way. If we pick filters, uh, it looks like the filters, the reason this is a little bit lower res is this code, there's a whole bag of tricks that you can add to this uh, to generate higher res, really pretty images. This is the minimum amount of code to make it work. And that's what we get from these filters. Uh, but you can play with it to detect different things. And here we're getting lots of eyes and stuff like that. So Deep Dream is this really, really, really cool result. Um, what Deep Dream is doing is it's proving that, uh, yes, in the process of training a CNN, you're learning filters. The automatic feature engineering magic is learning filters that detect things we see in the world. And um, if you look at the older implementation in TensorFlow 1, which has all the tricks, but is way, way longer, uh, Ignoring the code, the authors of this library, they visualized every single filter in every layer of a pre-trained CNN. And you can see exactly what you see in a lot of diagrams. So these are images that really excited the different filters in the first convolutional layer. And it's a little hard to see, but they're basically detecting different colors and different edges and different orientations. So that's layer one. As you move up the network, you'll start to see filters that are responding to uh, textures of different types. And these are a little bit harder for me to interpret. But the point is, 
patterns are getting more abstract as we move up the network. And the deeper you go, these still don't make sense to me, but they start to resemble things that you might, I don't know, you could name them if you really tried, right? Some are pretty. And as you go really deep, you start to get things that are semantic -y. So here, whatever this is, and this looks like some strange combination of cute dogs and eyes and snakes and who knows, what this literally is, is this is some filter. So if you say like com, if like layer five in the network is conv 2 d 64 this might be like the eighth filter in that convolutional block. And this is an image that will make that filter super excited. So whatever that filter detects is right here. And the reason it's tessellating across the image is because the convolution is sliding. So that's why we see the same pattern repeating. But this is a really big deal. It's an amazing insight. Uh, and if you, you can play with this for a long time, you'll see some things that are really creepy because of the snakes. This is pretty. So there it looks like trees. But um, what deep learning is, it's many things. But one way of talking about it is deep learning is representation learning. Another way of saying it is it's automatic feature engineering. And that's what you're getting with Deep Dream. Uh, yes. These great question. Do these images start with an image or random noise? They start with random noise. Exactly. You can do this in two ways. You can start with random noise or you can start with an image. And yes. It's a it's a good idea. Um a good insight. Yes. Ah, these are all from one classifier. So here we're looking at VG, I think I clicked on VGG, but I forget. So this would be VGG, which is famous architecture, trained on ImageNet, and then that model's static. And we start with random noise, and we choose a layer and a filter, and then we get the gradients using that little loop that I showed you, and then we iteratively adjust the random noise to increase that. Yeah, but it's all the same model. And so when you download VGG, like you're not just getting the classifier, but you're getting, as an artifact of training the classifier, you get uh, inside that model, there's representations of all this stuff. There's another really similar piece of work that I want to show you because it's pretty, but it's outdated. So it's called style transfer. So don't, don't do this now. We have this because it's an awesome, awesome, awesome paper, but it's outdated. So again, we used our turtle. And this is like the ugliest version of style transfer ever. Let me show you. Um, Thanks, Google, for the auto. So this is, this is a, the MIT Strata Center, Strata Center. Anyway, you start with a photograph, and you start with a painting, and you try and produce a new image that merges them too. And uh, by the way, the way you would do style transfer now is with a GAN, which is both simpler and works better. But this uh, is very, very, it's a close friend of Deep Dream. And what you do, we're not just stacking these images. This is also one of these magical artifacts of given that we have an image classifier, what else can the classifier do? And the idea is this, if we forward both of these images through the classifier, layers close to the input in the CNN detect edges and shapes. And these are texture-like things, right? Edges close to the output detect eyes and stuff like that. And those are content-like things. We can write a loss function. We start with an image that's random noise. And the goal is when we forward this image through the network, it will excite the early layers in a similar way to the style image, and it will excite the later layers in a similar way to the content image. So it's a very, very similar idea to Deep Dream. And uh, we have the complete code for it on the website. Basically, we're picking some layers that are content-y from late in the network. We're picking some layers that are styly from earlier in the network. And then we start with random noise. There's some math. But anyway, if you scroll through it, you'll see the loss function. So that's, that's style transfer. The way you do style transfer today is cycle GAN. Uh, and the authors uh, shared these graphics with us. They're from the paper, but they gave us the higher resolution, which I really appreciate. Style GAN. Uh, you can do style transfer things, right? Except you can go, they're, they're a little bit higher 
quality. So you have photos to different artists. You can transfer between different artists. You can do winter to summer. One thing you could do too, and you won't have time for it during the workshop, you need to train this for like 10 hours. It's gonna be difficult to do in CoLab. You wanna use your own hardware. The lab has fast hardware, leave it running overnight and you'll have a good time. Um, uh, winter to summer works really, really well. One thing I wanna show you about the CycleGAN tutorial is image generation CycleGAN. Yeah, we have a whole bunch of CycleGAN data sets from the paper built into TensorFlow data sets. So here, this is picking horses to zebras, but if you follow this link, here's a whole bunch of data sets from the authors that we have built in. So if you wanna modify CycleGAN to go from summer to winter or whatever, you can just change a single keyword in that tutorial and run the model and it will do it or you can collect your own directories of images. You could transfer between uh, Berkeley and Livermore or whatever you want. Um, so it's really, really cool. This is a thing called TensorFlow datasets, by the way. Um, TensorFlow datasets is conveniently different from tf.data or TensorFlow data. TensorFlow datasets is a large collection of datasets, things like MNIST and other famous ones like ImageNet uh, that you can import in TF data format. Great question, so what do we do for feature engineering in TensorFlow? Yes, uh, there's a bunch of stuff. So in deep learning, the best place to start, so there's, there's broadly two classes of machine learning problems. So uh, if you have structured data, and by structured data, I mean you've got a spreadsheet or a CSV file with you know, the rows could be customers and the columns, which are your features, might describe things like demographic data, like uh, for ignoring fairness and privacy, like age, gender, income, whatever. It's a small number of features that are very meaningful to us. Uh, when you have data like that, uh, traditional models like trees work extremely well. It's very, very hard to beat a decision tree with deep learning until you have, the other type of problems you have are deep learning problems where you have lots of features like pixels or words where individual pixels don't mean much to us, but because of this feature engineering trick, it can transform them into more meaningful representations. So you have these two flavors of problems. Deep learning does work for structured data too. Often you need more data, lots of data, before you start outperforming these methods. So if you have a structured data problem, really strong baseline is a decision tree. Slightly stronger is a random forest. A gradient boosted tree is gonna be even better, probably. And start there, and then you could see if deep learning can compete. I'll go back to feature engineering and deep learning in a sec. Here's what you can do with deep learning though that you can't do with trees. Uh, Kaggle Pet Finder. There's this really awesome new data set from Kaggle. Uh, and the authors gave us, Pet Finder gave us permission to use it, which I really appreciate. I haven't had a chance to work on this yet. Uh, what's cool about this is whatever, I'll just tell you. This is a database from Pet Finder. The goal is to predict how long it takes for these pets to be adopted. The reason this is a cool database, it's an important problem, but it's a cool database because it has three types of data. It has structured data or tabular data, which is basically fields like the ID of the pet, the name of the pet, the breed of the pet, gender. So these are scikit learning fields you might use a tree for. It also has pictures of the pets. And presumably, if you looked at a picture of the pet, that would be an informative feature. And it has free text. So that's like something that they wrote, like, you know, Fluffy is a six-year-old, whatever, and she's really awesome and playful. And so we have these three types of data, unstructured text, tabular data, and images. And what this means is this is a good use case for deep learning on structured data because you can train a joint model that takes all these things at once. And so that's really when you wanna use deep learning on structured data. Uh, let me point you to the tutorials we have, which are okay. Uh, we're working on improving these. This doesn't belong in machine learning basics, but it's there haphazardly. And <clears throat> classify structured data. And what this will do this is just a starting point. Like, don't copy and paste this and try and train it on a large data set. Uh, this is importing like a 300 line scikit learning data set from the Cleveland Clinic for heart disease. And it's predictive a patient has heart disease based on this data. And uh, what this is doing is it's showing different ways that you can represent this data for a neural network. So we do do some feature engineering only with structured data. And let me point you to a tool that you can use. It's called facets. 
Uh, the way to find this tool, Facets, it's from a team called Pair. <clears throat> they do people and AI research. So if you search for Pair, P-A-I-R, Facets, you'll find this tool. It's not a TensorFlow tool, it's just a, a useful thing, but it can demonstrate what we do. And Facets, it has this nice thing here where you can upload a CSV file and you can visualize it. Uh, the CSV file that's, it's got a nice little button you can, you can use, it runs in the browser. The CSV file that's already here is from the US Census. Uh, it's a subset of the 1990 census. And the goal, this is like a perfect storm for fairness, is predict if somebody makes more or less than $50,000 a year. So we can color the data set. Nice, so nothing will happen. Nice. So what I've done is I've colored the data set. Blue dots, less than 50K. Red dots, more than 50K. What's cool is if you click on a dot, you'll see the row from the CSV file that corresponds to that dot. So this person's 38, they had a capital gain. And so this type of data makes sense. I'm actually surprised, I think I clicked on a blue dot, so less than 50K. I'm surprised that somebody had a capital gain that large and made less than 50,000. So I think this is probably an outlier. But anyway, um, they're a high school grad. Ah, anyway, structured data. What facets means is bucketing. So let's say that this is basically a tool to poke around with your data and get to know it. So let's say I wanted to facet it or bucket it. What I could do is I could bucket it by age. And so now we've divided it into age buckets. And we can see that these kids very rarely make more than 50K. And as you have people that are sort of, I, I don't know, maybe these are like prime income years or whatever, you see that the ratio changes. Uh, and you can bucket it again. So if you wanted to poke around, you could bucket it by whatever you want. You know, you could do it by education or jobs, and facet is a fancy word for bucket. But one type of feature engineering you might do in deep learning is you might bucket your data. Uh, so you might try and make it easier for the model. If, if you knew off the top of your head that it didn't matter if they were 33 or 34 or 35, you might get rid of those features and just replace them with simpler ones by bucketizing the data. Um, I think more interesting than this, uh, there's another tool that Pear just released, and it's called the counterfactual tool, or it's this. It's the what if tool. Yes. Oh, thanks. I should stop talking. Thanks. I'll give this last slide, and I'll point. Am I out of, the, out of time? Thanks for reminding me. So here's the last slide, and I'll give you books, and I'll stop talking. This is a tool called what if, and it's uh, new to me. It finds something called counterfactual examples. And what that means is, let's say you uh, are predicting if somebody's gonna get a loan for a mortgage, and the answer is no. This will find them the closest point in the data set where the answer was yes. So it's called a counterfactual example in the what if tool. And books, do you want? I'll give you two. So the last one is Deep Learning with Python. That's the Keras book, it's awesome. If you want the TensorFlow 2 book, there's only one TensorFlow 2 book. It's by Aurelian Jerome. It's the top one there. Only get the second edition, which is not released yet, but you can start reading it on O'Reilly's website. They have a free trial. Uh, only get the second edition. The first one teaches TensorFlow 1, which you don't want. So thanks very much, and I'll be around during the hands-on workshop. I can help with any questions. So thanks.